Hey everybody, welcome back guys. I am KRX and we're going to be continuing this beginner's tutorial for the Ottomans. We are playing with all the DLCs on the Emperor, including the Emperor DLC on the Austria patch, the 1.3 patch. And guys, again, I, I really have to stress like this game takes hundreds of hours to learn. We haven't unpaused the game yet. We probably won't unpause the game this time because we haven't looked at our internal situation. We've only really looked, ex we've only really talked about our diplomats and looked at how we can assess the situation, right? The other thing I want to talk about really quick, if, if you guys will allow me to monologue for a second, is that, is that this is not a guide to the Ottomans. This is not a guide to the Ottomans. It's not a strategy for the Ottomans. I've never played the Ottomans before. How could I teach you a strategy of a country I've never played, right? A lot of the times the guides on, on the YouTube are just like, oh yeah, it's a guide to France. It's an it's a England guide. It's a, cause What's the point in that? That only works if you're playing that one nation. There's hundreds of nations in this game. What I'm doing to you, what I'm doing here uh, for you is, is teaching you a process, right? This is a process of playing a nation. This, this applies to any nation, right? This isn't just the Ottomans. We're applying the process to the Ottomans and hoping to teach people how to play the game through a question and answer. How do we actually ask these questions that'll get us to want to find the answers that we need to be able to make decisions and progress in the game? That's going to allow people who are brand new to the game to actually confidently play the game and make their own choices. Um, and we're playing as the Ottomans just an as an example of that. Maybe it's perfect that I haven't played the Ottomans before, right? So we're just having to go through this stuff and figure this stuff out, look at the internal situation, look at the exterior situation, and just assess and make decisions and, and move in move forward in the game. Okay. And, but it takes hundreds of hours to learn this game. There's no such thing as a quick tutorial. There's no way you can learn the concepts, especially with the DLC, guys. I gotta say, after playing that Portugal series with no DLC, we do have a beginner guide for no DLC users. We're playing as Portugal on that, and that's a pretty good guide. It's pretty slow paced. It's pretty thorough. There's some things that we speed over a little bit, which is bad, and that's why we're gonna continue to make these tutorials. Hopefully that we'll, we'll ultimately work our way up. We have to learn, I have to learn. You guys are trying to learn the game, but I have to learn how to make better tutorials. That's part of what I'm doing. I'm here practicing the process of making better tutorials. That's what I'm trying to do. And then also just make tutorials while we practice, right? Um, so the Portugal run is really good if you don't have the DLCs. The DLCs add so much content, it is insane, and it makes the process of to learn this game and the intertwining of the different systems in this game much more involved and much more complicated. So um, there is no quick, there is no quick uh, way to learn this game, unfortunately. You're either excited and enthusiastic about this game and you will learn it because of that enthusiasm, because of that excitement, or um, you know you might realize this game maybe unfortunately uh, isn't uh, isn't for you, because I think trying to find the quick start guide the 15 minute you know i'm going to learn everything about eu4 in 15 minutes i think you're going to have kind of a probably a bad time um anyways let's let's get back to what we're doing i'm sorry guys we're getting a little off track here we have we have used our diplomats right we have one diplomat getting an alliance with qq they'll be back in a few days we have one diplomat that's buttering up poland they'll be back when we tell them to come back home but we might be able to actually butter them up enough to get an alliance with poland which would be kind of neat we are using one diplomat to create a uh, fabricated claim to create a claim on Constantinople because we know that this is such an important um, province uh, for our country for sort of the continu continuity of our country right it's literally in the middle of our country we need to we want to be able to walk through here we can walk through here for now right there's a little dash line right there that says we can walk through here I can grab these troops and move through there but we can't move we'd have to go around Constantinople um, and, and Constantinople of course just historically is a really important trade center and stuff like that we do want that province we have some missions up here we haven't or not missions i'm sorry missions or something else and we will discover those shortly we have some national decisions up here and we didn't talk about this at all in the first bit and we can see if we go here these are basically the ones that are available to us and these are the ones that are not available to us so this is a mission to unify islam it's like it's and we can hover over the question mark to see why don't we why isn't this available yet well we, we need to own all these different provinces these are specific provinces that we need to own that we don't have and then if we owned all that, we could actually form a new country. We could we could reunite the caliphate and actually unite Islam. And, and this is like a big, this could be our goal for the run. There's actually an achievement to do this. So we could actually try to do this. But if we looked here and there's a way to find these provinces by hitting the F key, right? If I hit F and let's say I search for Thada, which I believe is in India, if I'm not crazy. Um, so Thada is over here. It actually just took us to Thada, right? I used the search function and typed in the province name. 
don't know why like it takes F to bring it up, but it's adding an F there. It's kind of annoying. Um, anyways, so that is over here. That's quite a ways away. That's that's a challenge, right? We would have to do a significant amount of conquest in order to get ourselves over here to get that one province. That's only one of all the provinces that we need. So so unifying Islam is a big challenge, but the Ottomans are definitely capable of doing that. And that could be a future goal for us. That could be something that we want to achieve within the 400 years that we can play this game, right? It's only 1444. We have 400 years to play this game before the game ends. Or we might just do something more humble and, and finish the game much sooner than that. We don't have to play for the full 400, 400 years. I rarely ever play till the end of the game. I usually quit after a couple hundred, couple hundred years, you know? Um, that's usually when I can accomplish my goal by then, depending on what the goal is and depending on the country that I'm playing. These are the ones that we've completed, though, and we can see why we've completed. We have a certain amount of military power. It says up here, this is military power, so we have 150. It says we have at least 100. Um, we have enough, uh, we have a height of blah, blah, blah. Different, our ruler is relatively skilled, so we're, we're hitting some check marks over here, it looks like. But essentially, we can go through, okay, yearly prestige. You don't know what that means, but there you go. It says it moves towards legalism. Okay, that's something to do with the religious mechanics. We haven't talked about that, but let's just hit these. A national unrest. Well, negative national unrest, reducing the national unrest, keeping the stability. That makes sense, right? We don't know anything about these metrics yet, but this is, this, this, like, it sounds like a good thing. Like, lowering national unrest sounds like a good thing. Increasing missionary strength versus heretics. Well, we know we have a missionary. So presumably we need a certain amount of missionary strength to be able to convert provinces to the true faith, right? The Sunni faith. And we know that we have a lot of land here that is not a Sunni. Although I will say that Orthodox is not a heretic. This is for heretic religions. Orthodox would be a heathen religion as in relation from the perspective of a Sunni nation, right? But we do have some Shia. We do have some Shia over here at the edge of our country. These guys are a heretic Islam. This is a heretic Isra Islam religion. So we want that so that we can maybe potentially convert them. We are also uh, able to lose some of this military power, which is used to make technologies and do other military actions and stuff like that. Military power is incredibly valuable. Incredibly valuable. So to spend a hundred of it is like a big ask. That's a tall ask. But it says to, we will get a benefit until the end of the game. We just said that this game lasts for 400 years. 400 years of additional manpower modifier. We don't know anything about manpower. Power. Very important stat, though. I'm just, while we're on this screen, I'm just going to hit this button right here. This is a, a small, this is, we'll be earning man military power the entire game. So if we could spend 100 of it to get a bonus for the entirety of the game, that seems worth it. That seems worth it. And we're going to earn tens of thousands of military power throughout the game. We might as well get that now and get that manpower modifier going now. Um, that's also, I think, a special Ottoman uh, button, specifically. We have a new banner. Because we increased our missionary strength, we actually have a new banner. You can convert provinces to Sunni. So we, it's saying here we can't convert any of the uh, we can't convert any of the Orthodox. We're not strong enough to convert these. And you can see there's a huge negative 100% um, modifier there because it is it is actually guaranteed to the, the Dimi. This is... Um, this is a different sort of political faction within our country that is basically controlling the Orthodox provinces, the Dimi. And um, we, can, we can try to manipulate that to eventually unify this area and, and, and factor this into our, um, and, and get these people to be the Sunni faith, or we could just sort of um, let them kind of coexist. Because right now they're not actually hurting us because we're allowing the Dimi to take a, and have a little bit of power. This is a, this is a totally different. Again, the DLCs can make things so much more complicated, unfortunately. Um, and part of this is is part of this is DLC features. Part of this is base game features. It's just a bunch of things interweaving together. Point of the story is we cannot convert these provinces at this time. It's just it's just completely impossible. But we do have the missionary strength. We have a net missionary strength of 1.1. So you know how when you're asking for alliances and it's like there's reasons to for and reasons against. It's kind of like that with missionary strength. We have a base two. We have enforced religious unity. That's the, the, the decision we just took. So that's 4% positive. And then it looks like because of the development of the province and the fact that Shia, there's a there's a 2.9% penalty. So altogether, we have a 1.1% positive. That means that that means that it'll take 92 months for this to convert based on its development and, and other factors and stuff like that. I think at 1%, it would probably take 90 months to convert a nine development province, right? That's kind of what I'm looking at this just I, I don't know the exact numbers but it just kind of seems how this is all working out but we have a 1.1 percent and presumably if we had a two percent or three percent or four percent then this would go down really fast it says that it'll cost us 0 0.38 per month to do this though okay so it's going to cost us money per month to do this 
We only have we have 65 ducats in the treasury right now. How much are we making per month though? Because we kind of need a relic, we kind of need to understand our monthly income to know whether or not 0.3 ducats is that a lot? Is that a little? Well, for some countries, that's a lot. Uh, for the Ottomans, though, we can go to our economy screen. We can see the Ottomans are making some good money here. The Ottomans are making four and a half ducats a month without us even like manipulating any of this without us even trying to optimize our income or trying to optimize our expenses which this is usually in my experience you income is increased through either war and sort of infrastructure building building buildings and stuff like that and working on long-term projects right income there's no quick fix to just getting a lot more income but expenses are something that we can balance we can cut military spending we can cut fort maintenance we can cut other kinds of things. We can fire advisors if we're paying for advisors and stuff like that. We can cut expenses. So expenses, in fact, right now we could lower army maintenance and we could start making a lot of money if we stop paying for our 30,000 troops, right? And the thing is, if we don't pay for our troops, they'll lose their morale. They'll lose their ability to fight in wars. They cannot fight with no maintenance, but we can always raise their maintenance up before we go to war. So one of the common things that a lot of people like to do is lower maintenance. However, there are other things with the DLCs and with the Ottomans that we might be more interested in actually doing that we could do with our armies while they're at peace. We can either drill them and make them more disciplined, sort of in a sense, thematically. We can make them more um, powerful and more fierce and better fighters by training them and drilling them during peace. Or we could just have them loafing around getting full salary, which we don't want to do that. So typically what you do is you either drill the army and you pay for them and drill them and make them better, make them stronger, or we can actually reduce maintenance on them and actually sort of get more money um, from that. And I think since we have so much money here, let's actually go the route of drilling them. But we can definitely, without question, we could definitely afford to actually send this missionary and convert this. This will take uh, this will take multiple years though, right? This will take like seven years, but this will get done eventually. And it is contributing to uh, non-unity. We have a 94% religious unity that's because all of this is not counting against our unity. Because these are controlled by the Dimi, it doesn't actually hurt our, our, our national unity. Everybody's totally cool. We're living in peace with the Orthodox right now. It's totally fine. But the Shia, no, that's not cool. That's hurting our religious unity. That's affecting our national unrest. That's affecting our stability cost modifier, yearly corruption, all kinds of bad stuff. So we want to make sure that these guys are Sunni. We want to make sure those guys are Sunni. Looking at our economy screen... What we might be able to do, though, instead is actually we're paying five ducats a month in forts. In fact, if we go to a fort map mode down here, we can see we have a fort, a fort, a fort, a fort, a fort. We have a bunch of forts all around here. A bunch of forts around here. And at, when you're at peace, you don't really need these maintained. But if you think you're going to get attacked by another nation, you want these maintained. It takes a little bit. What we can do is we can go to these provinces, come down here, and actually moth, what's called mothball the forts. Reduce the garrison to zero. That means if someone comes in here, they can siege this quickly. Forts, what they do is they're a defensive position to withhold and push back the enemy, essentially, right? And advancing armies cannot move through forts just for free. They have to siege them down. They're roadblocks for enemy movements of troops. Enemies can move through these provinces willy-nilly. But as soon as they get within a zone of control, these forts are emitting a zone of control on these areas. They cannot move. They're, in, like, they're, they're, they're basically inhibited to move. Um, so these areas are com are creating a zone of control. The troops cannot move through here because of these forts are, are pr preventing the movement. Um, they, they get pinned down, basically, in these areas. So they're really, really powerful. But if we're not planning... We're a very big, scary nation. We're, a, we're planning to attack into Constantinople and go on the offensive. We don't actually need to pay for these forts. The only reason why we'd have to pay for these forts is if we felt threatened by a neighbor. Like, if we felt threatened by these guys over here, we could maintain this fort. But the thing is... These guys would be crazy to attack us. The AI is not suicidal. They will only attack us if they believe that they have a winning chance. These guys have a standing army of 7,000 because we can just look at them and see. We have a standing army of 30,000 men. There's no way these guys are going to attack us. Um, so we can actually reduce that and actually cut the maintenance of those forts by half. So we're only paying 2.5 now. We're now making more ducats per month. Good. Good, good, good. We're paying some missionary maintenance, state maintenance. Since that's something we can't affect. We are just going to be paying a certain amount of sort of administrative monetary maintenance on our on our uh, provinces, right? We're just paying a certain amount of money based on how big our country is and how many states we're, we're controlling at the moment. So the other thing we can do is we can hire advisors. Now that's going to actually tie right into this, this economic discussion because it's like, can we afford advisors? Well, we have 6.6 .6 ducats worth of income per month. 
So yeah, I think we can afford advisors. So we can go in here, advisors, what advisors do. It says no advisor. This is an administrative advisor. They increase our administrative skill. We haven't talked about these different skills, but these are incredibly important. And we can see that our leader even has administrative skill and diplomatic skill and military school. And we, we talked about how six was the highest that a leader could have. So our leader is incredible. They also, our leader also has a special trait. This was added in a DLC that, that leaders can earn special traits throughout their lifetime. Our leader is a conqueror. That is really, really good. Although we don't know anything about years of separatism. Basically, this means that as a conqueror, you can imagine that we're just really good at conquering things. And, and there's a bit like we're getting, this is a, this is a modifier that's going to help us more easily conquer and integrate people into our country. So we are, we are a born conqueror. That's good because that's what we want to do right now, right? We're the Ottomans. We need to clean up Greece. We need to clean up um, sort of uh, Asia Minor. We need to beat up Constantinople, right? We need to conquer some things. So being a conqueror, that's good. Years of separatism, negative years of separatism, that's good. We'll see what that means when we actually conquer something. That'll, that'll make more sense. So we have an amazing leader, an amazing leader, absolutely fantastic. And we're in total right now, we're making eight administrative power, six diplomatic and 11 military, which is huge. We're making more military because it says there's plus two for national focus. And if we go to admin, it can see three for base, six for leader, right? So three plus six is nine. Why are we making eight? Because minus one for national focus. It looks like by default, the game has by default selected military focus as the focus of the nation. So we are actually pulling from admin and diplo to bolster our military power gain which is actually going to be good because we just spent 100 military points on a policy. So that's good. So we need to get, we need to kind of recover a little bit of that military. But this also ties into technology. This is how you gain administrative technology, diplomatic technology, and military technology. If we take a quick glance at the technology tab here, we can see that these are uh, the different technologies. We're at tech three for all of them. That's how we start the game. And we can see military technology will get more morale, which is good. Morale is just like health for our troops. It's, it's their eagerness to fight. The more morale they have, the longer they fight, the longer they fight, the more likely they win the battle, right? The more likely the other side gives up and loses their morale to fight. Military tactics will factor into our, basically our, our efficiency as fighters, our discipline and our efficiency as fighters. It'll make our, our troops fight uh, just smarter rather than harder, right? So it'll make us better, more efficient in battle and in, essentially do more damage and take less damage, right? We'll have better military tactics in battles. So these are incredibly powerful stats, incredibly powerful stats. Military tech four is one of the most important in the game. Getting that first could be a huge difference in a quick early uh, war uh, at the beginning. But of course, after military tech four, there'll be military tech five and six and seven. You'll just keep getting more military techs all the way through the entire game. Same with diplomacy and same with administrative. Um, and administrative is going to start unlocking us different buildings and things like that. So this is a mosque. If we get to administrative tech four, we can get a mosque and we can build it for a hundred ducats and it'll increase local tax modifier by 40%. So we can build this in provinces that generate a lot of tax revenue. And we can use that to specialize that province and increase the economic return on those provinces. And after over time, maybe 50 years or hundred years in the game, this it'll actually have paid for itself, right? And we'll be able to get a return on investment on this building over time so we can actually build up our internal country these different provinces here we closed this right in the last episode we accidentally when we clicked on a province it showed the building tab and i closed that because i didn't want to look at that right there but we can open up the building tag and say hey this building right here this province has it generates a certain amount of taxation we can see that here base taxes for that's that's related to its total development the wealth and the richness of this province is 11 and that's separated as four base tax, four production, and three manpower. So these are the things that this is contributing to our country as a whole every month or every year, however you want to look at it. And these have different building slots. So we can go here and build buildings. But all of these buildings require technologies that we don't have. Diplomatic technology, eight. Um, administrative technology, six, right? The mosque is administrative technology, four. So this is one of the first ones that we unlock is the mosque. We could build a castle here if we had the 200 ducats. But we, don't, might, we might not need a castle here. Right? We already have castles all around here. We already noticed that we already had five castles all around this central heart of our country. We might not need a castle here. Castles, you build those in strategic provinces. There's other benefits to forts. We'll talk more about that probably when we get into a war. Point of the story is these areas are ripe for building buildings, right? And to be able to build buildings here that are specialized to the province and that can increase our economic output, whether production or trade or tax taxation, is all good, right? So we're going to be wanting to build a lot of pro uh, buildings in these provinces and to get those buildings unlocked, we'll need more technologies. 
So mil- so powers are incredibly important. Getting these powers faster means we can get more technologies faster. These powers also do a, a multitude of other things. As you can see, we spent some of it to do a policy. There's another really cool thing we'll be able to do very shortly with our military power, but there's tons of stuff that, that just in a general sense that the powers are used for. Tons of things like military power is used to train generals. We haven't even looked at that, but, but if we want generals to lead our armies, we need military power to hire them and so on and so forth. So we can actually get advisors and what these advisors do, if I click on this and see the available advisors that we can choose from, we pay them a little bit of a signing bonus and then they pay a monthly, there's a monthly salary and then they give us a little quirk. So, so yearly inflation reduction, um, stability cost modifier, production efficient. We haven't really talked about yearly inflation reduction or stability cost or, or if these things are relevant or important. But what I'm looking at is I'm looking at the fact that this guy's a level two. He's a level two. He costs us two ducats a month. We're making six and a half per month. And he's actually cheaper to sign on. This, guy's a, this guy is a historical figure and he is a cheap level two advisor. So there's a special thing going on here where we're getting a discount on this guy. That's unusual. This is just because we're playing the Ottomans, I guess. Um, so we're basically going to grab this guy here because he's cheap for how powerful he is. He's going to increase the administrative power by two. We're literally getting 25% more administrative power by having this guy. And we're paying, admittedly, we're paying him a lot of money. Like that's a huge amount of our total expenses are now just going to one guy. But these, these powers are so important to fundamentally in advancing our country and taking different actions and progressing in the game. It is important to maximize these where we can afford um, we can look at uh, the diplomatic advisors here. We are look, spy network construction. We're building a spy network in Constantinople, and we might have to actually build more spy networks as well. So this guy actually might help us in terms of just building spy networks faster. He's cheaper. He's pretty cheap per month. See, this is a level two guy, but we can't afford him. Not even because he's going to cost us four ducats per month, which is twice as much as the other guy. This is a normal price level two. He also costs us 64 ducats just to sign him way too expensive, four times as much, right? So this guy costs four times as much and a level three advisor would cost four times as much and so on and so forth, right? So let's get a level one here. We could get a diplomatic reputation guy. This will help us make uh, alliances and, and, and get uh, sort of favors from our, from our friends and stuff like that. This guy's gonna help us actually do diplomatic actions with other nations. Very, very good guy. Very, very good. Um, but this guy right here, because we're building a spy network, what the heck, let's get that guy so we can build the spy network a little bit faster and, and sort of play into the fact that we're a conqueror. We're not a diplomat, we're a conqueror. We can look here at the military. We have two level twos that we totally can't afford, but we have another cheap level one. And we might as well do this because military power is really good and we can still afford these guys, right? Two ducats, one ducat, one ducat, that's four ducats. We're still making three ducats a month. This is good. In fact, even if we were paying for the forts, right, at 250, if we paid the extra 250, we'd still be making a small profit. Small profit, but it'd be a profit. So that's good. As long as you're making a profit, that's pretty good um, if you're making, as long as you're making a profit. Okay, so we've looked at our advisors. We've looked a little bit at our leader. We know they're amazing. In fact, they're 12 years old. I hope they live a long life. Um, if we look at these different tabs, we can see our government, right? So there's some different things going on. We are working on some things. We don't need to click anything. We don't need to investigate anything in here because the game will remind us when there's something to do here. We don't have to do anything there quite yet. This is our diplomacy screen. So we can just, re we, we looked a lot. We were staring at this quite a bit in the first thing, right? There's actually one thing I want to talk about here. Someone might have said in the first episode, Carex, why don't we just ally everybody? Well, one, it might be hard to get those alliances, right? Because we realize that some people don't like us. But why don't we just try to pursue an alliance with everybody that we're not going to conquer? Obviously, you don't want to ally someone that you're trying to go to war with. That's kind of counterintuitive. Um, it'll make it harder to go to war with them, not easier to go, go to war with them. So why don't we just ally everybody? Well, right here is a very important, very important number. Diplomatic relation slots. We're using two right now, one to guarantee Ragusa, one because we have a royal marriage with QQ. And we're going to try to upgrade that royal marriage to an alliance, right? That's what we're working on, is working on getting an alliance with them. But we can only have diplomatic, active diplomatic relations with four nations at a time without taking a penalty, a, a diplomatic power penalty. If we go over the four, we can go over the four. We could have an alliance with everybody in the game. We could have an alliance with 300 nations, but we'd be losing 300 diplomatic power per month. And we'd be just diving into the negatives and we would not be able to actually get technology, right? We would, we would cease to be able to actually advance in, in diplomatic technology, which would be very bad, right? So we, we want to save this diplomatic power because it's so useful for so many different things. It's so valuable to us. We don't want to get alliances that we don't need. 
We don't want to get diplomatic relations that we don't need. The, re the reality is the, the guarantee to Ragusa, this is reminding us, we already discovered this by looking through the map modes and just exploring the world, right? This is reminding us, hey, we have a, we have a guarantee with a Ragusa. We have a royal marriage with QQ. This is a good summary of our diplomatic relations. And the thing is, we could get an alliance with Ragusa, and it would still count as one. It's just it's just one. If you ha It's an interaction with each country. We can have diplomatic relations with four unique countries. It doesn't matter how many diplomatic relations we have with each one. So QQ, we could have a royal marriage and an alliance and a guarantee and military access. We can do all that with QQ, and it counts as just one. So we can have interactions with four countries. It doesn't mean we can't send a diplomat. You can see that we're we're buttering up, we're making Poland happy. We're sending a diplomat over there to help and just sort of make them happy, make them like us. That's not a diplomatic relation, right? That doesn't tie us down to to Poland, right? That's not a that's not something that we've agreed on. We haven't signed any sort of contract or treaty or anything like that. We're just going over there trying to butter them up. Maybe we will eventually want an alliance with Poland, but that's not what we've done yet. So that doesn't count. So we don't want to waste. We don't. We don't want to like frivolously waste diplomatic power trying to juggle extra diplomatic relations when we just don't need them. And the truth is, Ragusa, we might not really need Ragusa, but right now, I mean, it's that could be a strategic province. We might be sort of protecting Ragusa for ourselves, for a future conquest, by guaranteeing their independence now, by giving them a shield now. We might be keeping their independence, keeping them alive. Otherwise, they might just get beat up by their neighbors. Um, so that's something that starts the game that way. But the truth is we could end that. If we don't want that, we could just get rid of it. If we're like, hey, we need a different different relation. Ragusa, you know, I don't care that much about you. We're going to get rid of that and we can get, get it with somebody else, right? So we can we can shuffle these anytime we want. These aren't permanent for the whole game. We can change those anytime we want. Um, so anyways, diplomacy screen. We've looked at our economy. Oh, our trade screen, right, guys? We haven't looked at trade yet. We haven't looked at trade yet. You know what? Actually, so there's a few things here, guys, right? There's different tabs. We've looked, I'm, I'm kind of just going through the tabs now, which I know we didn't, we said we didn't want to talk about. But if we look at our economy, we didn't actually explicitly talk about what we were making money from. We're making money from taxation. We're making money from production. We're making money from trade. Oh, trade. Oh, look at that. There's a big trade tab, right? So this is, trade is one of the major aspects and production and trade are kind of tied together. But you can see most of our economy is coming from taxation right now, just having provinces and taxing our population. That's most of our income is just having that. But it could be that in the future, we could try to work on trade. And there's a lot of modifiers here that I'm totally not going to talk about. Um, and, and we could try to improve our trade route. And we knew that we are trade uh, income. And we knew that we had merchants, right? We have z zero available, but we have two merchants. And if we hover over this, it says they're in Aleppo and they're in Alexandria. So we can actually go to our trade map mode and we can see, oh, okay, like, hey, look, Constantinople. This is us kind of, right? Sort of sort of this is kind of us so we are actually collecting trade in constantinople we can click on this and say we earn five ducats here we're earning money from this node there's there's money here in this node it says there's 8.2 ducats here and we're earning five of it because we're getting 53 percent that doesn't quite add up because there's other modifiers that are boosting this number beyond just 53 percent of this but it starts with the 53 percent and then modifiers can enhance that you can see some of it's leaving constantinople some of it's flowing to ragusa actually right a ducket of it is escaping the node but not very much most of it's staying here so what we're doing with our merchants we can see and we can see this little symbol right here shows the merchant we have a merchant transferring trade power it says here it says this this specific person in fact what we could do is it, it actually shows you over here the merchants right if you guys if you guys can't see diplomats or merchants or armies or anything here just make sure you open up this plus and you go find the merchants and you make sure you highlight the merchants here okay that's going to be really really good to have that up that might be up because I've had it up just previously. Um, so make sure you have your merchants here just to remember that they're doing something. They're being active and they're doing something like worthwhile. Um, but they'll stay here until we move them or until something happens that will kick them out or boot them out or something. Um, so we're moving power. What we're doing is we're using these merchants to try to transfer some of the trade in adjacent trade regions that we don't collect from. You can only collect from your main region automatically. And then you can collect from other regions with a merchant, but instead... Since we have so little control over this, it's e it's better to actually create up a, a chain. You get little boosts if you actually flow it forward, if you push it forward. So we're actually getting more sort of value out of pushing this into Constantinople and co collecting it here as a big lump sum than trying to collect it out of these little bits, like little piecemeal collection bits. So we're actually making more money by, by pushing this into here. So the game has logically set this up. This makes sense, right? We could move from Crimea, but you can see Crimea, there's just less money in Crimea. There's way less money in Crimea than there is in Alexandria. And uh, between all of it, it's moving out of... Uh, it, it, to be fair, between 
between Aleppo and uh, Crimea, it's it's close, but we have a little bit more control over Aleppo. So it makes sense that we're pushing from Aleppo. And, and eventually we'll probably be conquering a lot of this land here and increasing our trade power in Aleppo. So, so I think the fact that our merchants in Aleppo is going to be totally fine. Not a big deal. Those guys are doing something logical. All I wanted to look at was that to make sure that they're doing something that makes sense. They're pushing trade power into Constantinople. To increase this trade power, we can actually use, we haven't talked about navies. So let's just do our little, like trade is, trade is one of those things that's infinitely complex, but it's also like to just understand the core flow of it is very simple. It doesn't take that much to understand the core flow of it. And we don't need to go into the nitty gritty details. We have traders that are in adjacent areas that are pushing it directly to our trade thing. And what you can do is you can actually create a chain. We could put a merchant down here that'll push it to Alexandria and this Alexandria will get pushed into Constantinople. We don't have the trade range for that, nor do we have the available merchants. But as we play the game, we could unlock more merchants through technologies and philosophies and ideas and stuff like that. We could get more merchants and we can get more trade range through technology and stuff, right? So when we have more trade range, we could try to create an actual line of merchants and that creates a synergistic boost that actually sort of creates like a flow, like a, like a ripple, kind of like a, like a, like a like a tsunami kind of effect you know where you're kind of like building 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 and then whoosh you know what i mean so so that's going to be something we're going to want eventually but right now we're not that far in the game to be able to create those those big massive merchant chains what we can do is though is we can actually take our fleet and we can see that we start the game with three light ships that's good cool three light ships let's go so three light ships we can actually protect trade with these suckers that's what the light ships are really good at, is they're good because they can protect trade. The other bits of our fleet, we can see that we also have seven galleys and 12 cogs. These are transports. They also can fight a little bit, but they're very weak. They're, they're very durable, but they have very low offensive ability. The galleys are very fierce, though, in inland seas. So heavy ships are the big daddies, basically. They're durable, hard-hitting. They are the toughest ships. They're also insanely expensive compared to all the other ships. But a heavy ship is very, very scary. Um, and having a fleet of heavy ships is very, very powerful. Although in the inland seas, the galleys get a 100% bonus to their sort of offensive prowess. So galleys are very strong in the inland seas, like the Mediterranean. So in this whole area here, in these inland seas here, the galleys are very, very good. Very, very good. Um, the transports here, again, are just sort of like, they're, they're a way to, they can absorb hits, they can take damage. And, and away from the galleys and they can also do a little bit of offensive but they can also just move our troops around if we need to actually transport our troops right so that's galleys the light ships they can still fight in combat they're not completely like helpless in combat not at all and they're also the fastest ships but mostly we're going to want to build up a lot of light ships to be able to protect trade in different regions and actually try to actually increase these percentages by using light ship fleets to come down here and occupy more of this this value right protect more of this trade and transfer more of this money up to Constantinople. So actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have these light ships go into Alexandria. They're going to go down to Alexandria and actually try to boost this 7% up and so that we can move more money up here and ultimately collect more of it as, it as more of it pours into Constantinople. That's going to be the idea. So our navy is doing something. These other ships here, we can basically just kind of hang out with those. We'll want those against the battle uh, for Constantinople. We'll want those guys at the ready. Otherwise, if we didn't need these ships for a foreseeable future, we could mothball them just like we mothball the forts. But mothballing them does mean they are completely incapable of fighting. And it takes, a, it takes six months or so for them to get back up to full strength. So you need to preemptively unmothball these guys. So for now, we're just going to... We're just going to not worry about that because if we go back to our economies tab, just to, we actually didn't quite highlight this, but our fleet maintenance is very low. Our ships are ultimately very cheap. So mothballing the ships, not mothballing the ships, paying for the ships, not paying for the ships, not really a big deal. Not really a big deal. Um, we're just going to leave them. We're going to pay for them. That's totally fine. We're still making good money. Even if we didn't pay for the ships, it would not be a significant change. It would not be a significant change. Okay, guys, I think for the most part, that's that we're def there's one massive thing that we need to take a look at before we unpause the game that we haven't talked about yet. But for the most part, I think that was a good second episode. We've looked at our internal economy. We've looked at our religious situation and how we can affect that. We've hit some dif uh, different policies. We have uh, looked at the powers, right? Admin power, diplomatic power, military power. We're starting to understand how those tie into technologies and things like that. And that's so important. We've uh, hired some advisors. We've done a number of different things, right? And in the next episode, I think we're going to finish up looking at some of the internal things that we haven't quite looked at. We could look at sort of our military a little bit. I mean, do we need to build more troops? How do we assess that? Things like that, right? So 
other things to look at internally, but then after that, I think we're ready to actually start um, un- unpausing the game and-, and letting it roll. Thank you so much, everybody, for hanging out. I'm sorry these these episodes are so long, but again, there's so many different intertwined systems here that it's it's it. We're trying to build a foundation. We're going slow. We're trying to build a foundation. We're trying to move from one subject to another thematically. I'm not trying to just go through and just read everything off without context, right? We're building a context to understand concepts as we as we explore them right as we sort of go through a natural process of exploring them and asking questions and answering those questions so thank you so much everybody for watching i will see you guys in the next one